Who Are We? The Ringing Cedar Series, Book 5, by Vladimir Migre, translated from the Russian by John Woodsworth, edited by Leonid Shiroshkin, read to you by Nicole, December 2018. Chapter 1, Two Civilizations. We are always in a hurry to get somewhere or get something. There is hardly a single one of us who doesn't desire to lead a happy life, find love and establish a family. But how many of us will actually achieve our desire? What determines our satisfaction or dissatisfaction with life? What determines our success or failure? What constitutes the meaning of life for each and every man, and for all mankind on the whole? What kind of future awaits us? These questions have been around a long time, but nobody has managed to come up with an intelligible answer. But I wonder, what kind of country will we be living in five or ten years from now? What kind of world are we leaving to our children? We really don't know. And, let's face it, none of us can ever picture our own future because we are always hurrying off somewhere. But to where? Strange, but true. The first clear glimpse I ever had about the future of our country came not from statisticians or politicians, but from Anastasia, a recluse living in the wilds of the taiga. And not only did she present a picture of a marvelous future, but showed step by step its feasibility even for our generation, a design, in fact, for the development of the whole country. It was while I was on my way from Anastasia's glade to the river that this firm conviction, for some reason, came to my thought. Her plan is capable of changing so much in this world of ours. When we consider that everything her thought conceptualizes inevitably turns into a real-life embodiment, we see we are living in a country with only a splendid future ahead of it. As I walked along, I thought about what Anastasia had said about our country's splendid future which might even come about in our generation's lifetime. It will be a country without regional conflicts, criminal gangs, and diseases. A country without poverty. And while I didn't understand all the thoughts she came out with, there wasn't a single thing she said this time that I felt like doubting. On the contrary, I felt as though I wanted to show everyone how right she was. I firmly resolved to do everything within my power to bring her plan to fruition. On the surface, it seems simple enough. Each family should be allotted a hectare of land for a lifetime use, whereon to set up its own kin's domain, its own piece of the motherland. But my thought was immersed in the details of this plan. They were utterly simple in themselves, and yet at the same time utterly incredible. Amazing! It isn't an agricultural scientist, but a reclusive woman from the taiga that has shown that with the right planting arrangement on a plot of land, it can take just a few short years to dispense with the need, with the need for fertilization. Not only that, but even the soil that isn't terribly fertile will be significantly improved. As a basic example, Anastasia referred to the situation in the taiga. The taiga has been around for thousands of years, and everything grows in it, even though it has never been fertilized. Anastasia says that all the things growing in the earth constitute the materialized thoughts of God, and that He has arranged everything so that man has no need to worry about difficulties in finding food. One needs only to try to understand the Creator's thought and create splendid things together with Him. I can cite an example of my own. The island of Cyprus, which I have visited, was a very rocky soil. But the ground wasn't always this way. Centuries ago, the island was home to some splendid cedar forests and orchards, and its many rivers were filled with the purest spring water. The whole island was like an earthly paradise. Then the Roman legions invaded the island and began to cut down the cedars to build their ships. Whole groves were felled. Today, the larger part of the island is covered with stunted growth. The grass looks burnt even in the springtime. Summer rains are a rarity, and there is not enough fresh water. The residents have had to import fertile soil by the barge load to be able to grow anything at all. So the upshot is, 
Not only has man failed to improve what has been created on the island, but his barbarous interference has actually made things worse. In outlining her plan, Anastasia said that it was essential to plant a family tree, and that people should not be buried in a cemetery, but right there on the beautiful terrain they themselves have nurtured. No headstone of any kind need be placed on the grave. It is a man's living creations, not something dead, that will serve as a memorial for his relations. And not only that, but his soul will be able to take on a material embodiment again in his earthly garden of paradise. People buried in a cemetery cannot end up in paradise. Their souls cannot be embodied in a matter as long as there are relatives and friends around thinking about their death. Headstones are monuments to death. Funeral rites were thought up by the dark forces for the purpose of confining, at least temporarily, the human soul. Our Father has never produced any kind of suffering or even grieving for His beloved children. All God's creations are eternal, self-sufficient, self-reproducing. Everything living on earth, from the outwardly simple blade of grass to man, is a self-constituted, harmonious, and eternal whole. Here, too, I think, she is right. Just look at how things have turned out. Today, scientists tell us that human thought is material. But if that's the case, it means that the deceased person's relatives, in thinking of him as dead, thereby keep on holding him in a deadened state, which torments his soul. Anastasia maintains that man, or more precisely man's soul, can live forever. It has the capacity to constantly re-embody itself anew, but only under certain conditions. These conditions are brought about by a kin's domain, established according to Anastasia's design. I am simply a believer in this design. As to proving or disproving her claims about life and death, I'll leave that to esoteric scholars who are no doubt more qualified for this task. I say... You're going to get a lot of opposition on that one, I observed to Anastasia, to which she only laughed and replied, It will all happen very simply now, Vladimir. Man's thought is capable of materializing and changing the shape of objects, predetermining events, creating the future. So it works out that any opponents who try to argue for the frailty of man's existence only end up destroying themselves, for they will bring about their own decease by their very own thoughts. Those who are able to comprehend their purpose and the meaning of infinity will start to live a happy life, eternally re-embodying themselves, for they themselves will produce with their thoughts their own infinity of happiness. I liked her plan even better when I began to calculate its economic potential. I have become convinced that any man, with the help of a family domain he establishes according to Anastasia's design, can ensure a poverty-free existence for himself as well as for his children and grandchildren. It is not merely a question of pro providing one's children with good food to eat or a roof over their heads. Anastasia said that the fence around the domain must be made of living trees, and that at least a quarter of the hectare should be given over to the forest. That means about 300 trees. They'll quite like be cut down in, say, 80 to 100 years, yielding about 400 cubic meters of lumber. Even today, lumber well dried and processed for finishing fetches at least $100 per cubic meter, meaning a total income of $40,000. Of course, one shouldn't cut down the whole forest at once, just the number of mature trees that are needed at the time, and then immediately plant new ones in their place. The overall value of a kin's domain set up according to Anastasia's design may be estimated at a million dollars or more, and any family can build one, even those with an average income. The house can be quite modest to start with. The main treasure will be the plot of ground, accurately and aesthetically laid out. Even today, wealthier citizens are paying big money to firms specializing in landscape design. There are about 40 such firms in Moscow right now, and they are always busy. For upwards of $1,500, they will take just the 100 square meters of ground around your house and turn it into a landscape designed with detailed accuracy and aesthetic beauty. 
It costs around $500 to plant a single conifer, about 6 meters high. But people who want to live in beautifully appointed surroundings are willing to pay big money for that. They end up paying it because it never entered their parents' heads to establish a family domain for their children. You don't need to be rich to do something like that. You need only to get your priorities straight. How can we raise our children properly if we ourselves don't grasp such simple things? Anastasia is right when she says that education begins with ourselves. I myself have had a strong desire to establish my own family domain, to take a hectare of land, build a house, and, most importantly, to put in all sorts of plantings around it. I want to set up my piece of the motherland, just as Anastasia described, and have it surrounded by other people's beautifully appointed plots. Anastasia and our son could establish themselves there too, or at least come visiting, and eventually our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Maybe our great-grandchildren will want to work in the city, but they will still be able to come to their family domain to relax. And once a year, on the 23rd of July, the all-earth holiday, the whole extended family will gather at home. I shan't be around then myself, but the domain I set up will remain, and the trees and garden it contains. I'll hollow out a little pond and put in some hatchlings so there'll be fish. The trees will be planted in the special arrangement outlined by Anastasia. Some things my descendants will like, others they may want to change, but either way I shall be remembered." And I shall be buried in my own domain, with the request that my grave not be marked in any way. I don't want anyone putting on a show of grief or making a sad face over it. In fact, I don't want there to be any grieving at all. I don't want a headstone with an inscription, just fresh, fresh grass and bushes growing over the body. Maybe some sort of berries, too, which will be useful to my descendants. What's the point in a grave marker? There isn't any, only grief. I don't want people coming to my domain to remember me with sadness, but with joy. Yeah, they'll see how I've set things up and arranged all the plantings. My thoughts kept intertwining in a kind of joyful anticipation of something grand. I'd better begin as quickly as possible, somehow start the ball rolling. I've got to get back to the city quicker, but it'll still be another ten kilometers just to get through this forest. If only I could get through it sooner. And all at once, out of the blue, statistics on Russia's forest lands floated to the surface of my memory. I didn't remember all the figures, but here's what I saw the one time in a statistical report. Forests constitute the basic type of vegetation in Russia, covering 45% of its land mass. Russia has the most extensive forest reserves in, in the world, amounting to 886.5 million hectares in 1993 with a timber volume of 80.7 billion. This means Russia holds 21.7% and 25.9% respectively of the world's forest and timber resources. The higher figure for the timber reflects the fact that in terms of its wealth of mature and productive forests, Russia is way above the world's average. Forests play a huge role, both in the gas balance in the atmosphere and in regulating climate on our planet. According to B.N. Mosiev's calculations, the gas balance of Russia's forests is 1,789 million tons for carbon dioxide and 1,299 million tons for oxygen. Annual carbon deposits in Russia's forests amount to 600 million tons. These huge volumes of gas exchanges significantly contribute to the stabilization of gas composition and climate of the whole planet. Just look at what's happening. I've heard it said some kind of special mission lies ahead for Russia, but that's not in the future. It's already unfolding. Just think, people all over the planet, to a greater or lesser extent, it isn't important, are breathing Russia's air. They're breathing the oxygen produced by this very forest I'm walking through right now. I wonder whether it's simply oxygen that this forest is supplying all life on the planet with, or maybe something even more important besides. My solitary walk through the taiga this time provoked no feeling of trepidation within me as it did before. I felt pretty much the same as walking through a safe park. 
In contrast to a park, of course, there are no laid-out pathways, and my journey was sometimes blocked by fallen trees or thick underbrush. But this time, there was nothing that irritated me. Along the way, I would pick berries, raspberries, and currants, for example, and for the first time my attention was drawn to the tremendous variety in appearance, even among the same kind of trees. And the vegetation, too, was arranged in so many different patterns. No two scenes were alike. For the first time I really examined the taiga, and it seemed a kinder place than before. No doubt this impression was due in part to the awareness that it was right here in the taiga that my very own son was born and was now living. And then, of course, there's Anastasia. My encounter with this woman has changed my whole life. In the middle of this endless taiga is Anastasia's little glade, which she has no desire to leave for any length of time. She would never exchange it for any, even the fanciest, apartment in town. At first glance, the glade appears to be just another empty space. No house, no tent, no household facilities. And yet look at how she brightens with joy every time she approaches it. And now, on my third visit, I've caught a similar feeling. Something like the sense of comfort one feels upon returning home after a difficult journey. Funny things have been taking place lately all over our world. It seems that, for millennia now, human society have been struggling for the happiness and welfare of the individual. But when you come right down to it, it turns out that the same individual, even though he lives at the very center of society, at the center of the most modern and civilized city, finds himself more and more often in a state of helplessness. He gets into a traffic accident, or gets robbed, or constantly falls into the grip of all sorts of aches and pains. He can't live without a drugstore nearby, or some dissatisfaction he can't even explain to himself provokes him into suicide. The suicide rate is increasing, particularly in civilized countries with a high standard of living. Mothers from various regions of the country are seen on TV pleading for help for their families threatened with starvation because they can't afford to feed their children. Yet here is Anastasia living with a little boy all alone in the taiga in what can only be called another civilization. Not a single thing does she ask for from our society. She needs no police or home security forces to protect her. She gives the impression that nothing bad can possibly happen in this glade, to either her or her child. It's true, we live in different civilizations, and she proposes to take the best of both of these worlds. In which case, the lifestyle of many people on the earth will change and a new and joyous commonwealth of humanity will be born. This commonwealth will not only be interesting, it will be new and unusual. For example... Chapter 2. Take a Taste of the Universe For a long time it bothered me that Anastasia appeared so content to leave her nursing child all by himself. She would simply put him down on the grass under some bushes or next to the dozing she-bear or she-wolf. I was already convinced that not a single creature would touch him. On the contrary, they would defend him to the death. But from whom? If all the animals around were acting like nannies, then who would they need to protect him from? Still, it was unusual to leave a nursing baby all alone and I tried to dissuade Anastasia, saying, Just because the animals won't touch him, that doesn't mean that there are no other misfortunes out there that could befall him. To which she responded, I cannot imagine, Vladimir, what misfortunes you have in mind. There are a lot of things that could happen to helpless children. Let's say he crawls up a hillock, for example, and then tumbles down it, twisting his ankle or his wrist. Any height of ground the baby could crawl up on his own would not cause him any harm. But say he eats something harmful. He's still too young. Everything goes into his mouth. So it won't be long before he poisons himself. And then who's going to be around to flush out his insides? There aren't any doctors in the neighborhood, and you don't even have an enema to flush out his intestines in the case of an emergency. Anastasia just laughed. What need is there for an enema, Vladimir? The intestines can be flushed out another way and much more effectively than with an enema. 
How so? Would you like to try it? It will do you a world of good. I shall simply bring you a few little herbs. Hold on, don't bother. I understand. You want to give me something to make my stomach upset. Your stomach has been upset for a long time, Vladimir. The herb I have in mind will expel anything causing your stomach harm. I get it. In case anything happens, you can give an herb to a young child and it will make him go to the bathroom. But why take things to such lengths when it comes to a baby? It will not go that far. Our son will eat nothing that is going to harm him. Children, especially those who are nursing, are accustomed to the taste of their mother's milk, will never eat anything else in any significant quantity, and our son will only take a little taste of any berry or herb. If he finds it noxious or bitter, a substance that could harm him, he will spit it out himself. If he eats a little of it and begins to affect his stomach, he will vomit, and that will help him remem remember and he will not try it again. But he will come to know the whole earth, not from someone else's reports, but by tasting it on his own. Let us allow our son to taste the universe for himself. No doubt Anastasia is right. It is true, nothing bad has happened to the little one so far, not even once. Besides, I noticed a particularly interesting phenomenon the creatures around her glade themselves train or teach their young how to interact with man. I used to think Anastasia was the one that did this, but later I became convinced that that is not something she wastes her time on. This is what I saw on one occasion. We were sitting in the sun at the edge of the glade. Anastasia had just finished nursing our son, and he was blissfully lying in her arms, Initially, he seemed to be having a nap or just dozing, but then, all at once, his little hand began touching Anastasia's hair, and he broke into a smile. Anastasia looked at her son and smiled back, whispering something in his ear with her tender voice. I saw the she-wolf come out into the glade with her brood, four cubs still quite young. The wolf came over to us and stopped about ten meters away and lay down on the ground. The cubs, trailing along behind her, quickly began nuzzling up to her belly. Upon seeing the wolf and her cubs lying there, Anastasia rose from the ground, babe in arms, and went over to her. She squatted down about two meters away and began inspecting the wolf's brood, her face all smiles and saying, Oh, what beauties our clever wolf has borne! One of them will most certainly be a leader, while this little one is the spitting image of her mama. She will be a joy to her mama, and a worthy inheritor to carry on the family line. The mother wolf seemed to be dozing, her languishing eyes closed tight either from drowsiness or from the soft caressing of Anastasia's voice. The cubs turned away from their mother's belly and began looking at Anastasia. One of them, still unsure of his step, began making his way over to her. The mother, who just a second before had looked so drowsily, suddenly sprang up, seized the cub with her teeth, and dropped him back among the others. Then the same thing occurred with a second cub. Then the third and the fourth, all trying to get closer to Anastasia. The inexperienced cubs continued their attempts, but the mother would not let them go until they had finished their little adventures. Two of the cubs began tussling with each other, and the other two sat meekly and kept a watchful eye on us. The baby in Anastasia's arms also noticed the wolf family. He began watching them, and then his legs began kicking impatiently, and he uttered some kind of beckoning sound. Anastasia reached out her hand toward the wolves. Two of the cubs began heading with unsure step in the direction of the outstretched human hand. This time, however, the mother didn't try to stop them. On the contrary, she began nudging the other two cubs who were still at play in the same direction. And before long, all four were right at Anastasia's feet. One of them began nibbling on one of her fingers, 
A second got up on its hind legs and rested its forepaws on her arm, while the other two crawled over to her leg. The boy started to squirm in Anastasia's arms, evidently wanting to get closer to the cubs, whereupon Anastasia let him down on the ground and he started playing with them, obvious, oblivious to anything else. Anastasia went over to the mother wolf, and after giving her neck a gentle stroking, came back to me. I realized that the wolf had been trained never to disturb Anastasia without being invited, and would approach her only upon a predetermined gesture. Now she was teaching the same rule to her offspring. The wolf, no doubt, had been taught this by her own mother, who in turn had learnt it from her mother and so on from generation to generation. All the creatures transmitted to their young the rules of interaction with man. A reverent and tactful interaction, it must be said. But who taught them that other kind of interaction, and how, to attack man? My exposure to the life of the Siberian taiga recluses raised a whole lot of different questions questions I could not have even imagined asking earlier. Anastasia has no intention of changing her reclusive, reclusive lifestyle. But, stop right there. When I think of Anastasia as a recluse, each time I associate the word recluse with someone who has isolated himself from society, from our contemporary information systems, but what is really going on? After each visit to her glade, I end up putting out a new book. A book that is discussed by all sorts of people, young and old, scientists and religious leaders. The way it turns out, it is not I who bring her information from our over-informed society, but it is she who offers me information that proves to be of great interest to our society. So then, who is the real recluse? Haven't we got caught up so much in the abundance, or more correctly, the seeming abundance of information at our fingertips that we have set ourselves apart, distance ourselves from the true source of information? It's simply amazing when you think about what's really going on. Anastasia's remote taiga glade serves as real information center like a launch pad propelling us into the other dimensions of our existence. Then, who am I? Who are we? And who is Anastasia? In any case, perhaps it isn't all that important. Something else is much more important, namely her latest sayings concerning the possibility of transforming the life of any individual man for the better or, for that matter, and matter, any country or even human society as a whole. And this is affected through changing the, li the living conditions of an individual. It's all incredibly simple. Just give a man at least one hectare of land. And she goes on to explain what to do with this land, and then... Incredible, how simple it is. And man will always be surrounded by the energy of love. Those in marital relationships will love their spouses. Their children will be happy. Many diseases will be eradicated. Wars and catastrophes will cease. Man will draw closer to God. She has, in fact, proposed the construction of a whole lot of glades similar to her own in the proximity of major cities. But this doesn't mean she rejects making use of our civilization's achievements. Let what is negative be pressed into service on behalf of good, she says. And I have come to believe in her plan. I believe in that splendid turn of events that is to come about as a result of implementing her ideas in our lives. And a lot of them seem so logical to me. All we have to do is go over everything, think everything through in the right order. We have to adapt her proposal to each location. I was especially struck by Anastasia's idea regarding land and its development. I could hardly wait to get home and see what scientists have to say about similar communities. Does anything along this line exist anywhere in the world? 
I wanted to see if I could start by designing a new community in all its detail and then start building it through the concerted efforts of those desiring to participate in its construction. Naturally, neither I nor anyone else can undertake the responsibility for getting this marvelous community of the future going all on our own. It is something we need to do together. We shall have to examine all the information collectively and design our community, taking into account mistakes other people have made.